Michael's cat. I have my little green book, thanks to Tyler from Let's Talk About Prepping. And on page one, I have this question. This was from Lewis of Mosaic Master One, who opened this up. And there will be more from Lewis's opening video later on, because it's important. And you probably can't read my chicken scroll, so I'll read it for you. So Lewis' question to me was why are preppers prepping to live like it's the 1700s? Why are they aiming to use primitive survival skills and primitive tools? What an excellent question! I've kind of touched on this before, but this is going to be a fairly long video, so grab a coffee and a vegan snack and let's settle in and let's talk about primitivism, but not in depth. So primitivism is a form of culture and art where technique is primitive. Now where it gets interesting in prepping and bushcraft and survival is that there is a premium placed on primitive skills. Using a bow drill, using a ferro rod, place for them is deemed to be higher in the ranking, judging by the number of videos, than using a BIC or getting a BIC to dry out after dropping it in fresh water. Because as Lewis pointed out to me, if you drop it in salt water, it'll never work again. Which I didn't know. But I live a long, long way from the salt water. So before I get into why I believe preppers are attracted to primitivism, and why I think it's a really bad idea, let's look at when people die. That's the ultimate goal of survival is, don't die, right? That's how you survive, by not dying. But using paleoarchaeology and archaeology, we have a pretty good idea using modern science, MREs, CAT scans, carbon dating, all that stuff, which you may or may not believe in, but it's actually true. We have a very good idea of the average age of death over various different cultures. So I'm going to just show some slides and talk about those cultures and when they died. Because I think it's really, really important that if you have a hankering to go back to the 1700s, to go back to the colonial times, to go back to a simpler life, it may have a dramatically bad effect on your survival. Now going back to the cave person days, what we have is mythology, we don't have any actual records, we do have bone fragments, okay? So based upon that, most cave people died at around the age of 25. The average age of death was 25. That does not mean that everybody died at 25. What it means is a large number of people died at the age of uh, 0 to 10, and then a large number died later on. So the actual statistical age of death was 25. Compare that now where it's about 81 in Canada and about 77 in America. I want to live as long as possible. As a cave person, statistically I'd probably make it to 70 if I survive childhood and if I survive middle age. But I really don't want to be a cave person because it was not very much fun. And the reason it wasn't very much fun was because they didn't have much technology. One of the first Western civilizations, of course, was ancient Rome. And they, on average, lost about 50% of their population by around about the age of 25 to 29. The average median death rate was round about 40 because people lived beyond 50 after that. If you made it through your 20s, you could probably make it to you were 75 if you were a woman and 79 to 80 if you were a man. It's still a large number of people dying in childhood and early infancy. And that, again, is because technology and various normal aspects of modern life that we take for granted in 2019 were unknown or unavailable to the ancient Romans. For those North Americans who watch me, and that's the majority, I want to talk a bit about the Aztecs. They died at around the age of 41.2 years. Pretty specific. Uh, when you get averages like this, take it with a grain of salt. It is interesting that a technological society that was incredibly advanced compared to cave persons did, in fact, still suffer huge amounts of childhood and infant mortality, i.e. death, and lived fairly short lives. Obviously, the richer you were in both ancient Rome and in the Aztecs, you were more likely to make it until later on in life. But death was still very, very much a common phenomenon. So going back to the 17th and 18th centuries, 
life in the 13 colonies in North America was quite great for some people and quite horrible for others. I'm not referring to the effect on the First Nations, which was a decimation probably from mostly from malarial-borne diseases and other infectious diseases they had no immunity to, but New England had good weather and good ability to get food and store it. So after the initial problems of setting up the, uh, the colonies there, people could expect to live to about 70, which isn't very much far off what they're living to now. And they were having large numbers of children, extended families and all the rest of it, because they were expanding. Now if you look at the cheesespeak, the cheesespeak colonies, it wasn't very good at all. Almost nobody made it beyond 40 or 50. Life expenses were incredibly low. And this is because of malaria, typhoid and dysentery. Malaria has killed more human beings than anything else ever. It's bucolic. It looks good. It looks natural. It's men versus the wild, taming nature, living a good and purposeful life by destroying nature, destroying balance and creating something out of wilderness. This is a very attractive thing. The ability of oneself to overcome huge odds and be ascended and triumphant in the end is a mythology that is throughout Western culture and to some degree through Eastern cultures as well. The idea that everything fails, everything's going to fail and nothing can be trusted to be permanent other than one's own physical labor and mental capacity it's an attractive thought, but as I've just shown, going back to the 1700s, which was pretty advanced, is going to be catastrophic for your personal chances of living a long, healthy life and for your families. By able to go back, but keep parts of what we have now, our chances of personal longevity and societal longevity will rise quite dramatically. But what does this mean for us? Why are we so attracted to things that don't make much sense from a survival point of view? Indeed, the ability of oneself to overcome huge odds and be ascended and triumphant in the end is a mythology that is throughout Western culture and to some degree through Eastern cultures as well. The idea that everything fails, everything's going to fail, and nothing can be trusted to be permanent other than one's own physical labor and mental capacity. It's an attractive thought, but as I've just shown, going back to the 1700s, which was pretty advanced, is going to be catastrophic for your personal chances of living a long, healthy life and for your families. By able to go back, but keep parts of what we have now, our chances of personal longevity and societal longevity will rise quite dramatically. But what does this mean for us? Why are we so attracted to things that don't make much sense from a survival point of view? Well, as I see it, there are three main arguments for incorporating primitive skills, buff crafting technology into your survival. The main reason, and this is one people always say, is, oh, will lose everything. If you're got, if you dropped out of an airplane in the middle of the forest you'll die unless you have all of these skills. Which is true. What they don't say is even with all of these skills your chances of survival are pretty slim anyway. And the mental and physical and cost to develop primitive bushcrafting skills in today's society are not small. The other argument is when technology fails you can go back to primitive technologies because they worked in the past and you can use them to maintain the longevity of technology that you have or you can use them to increase the ability to feed and water more people or home them. And again, yeah, but, and we'll get into the yeah, but. The third main reason, and I think it's the only valid reason for incorporating primitive skills, technology and abilities into your prepping, is it's fun. It's kind of fun to start a fire without any technology using a bow drill. I've never done it. I never will. I consider it as a prepper, it would be a complete failure of my prepping to have to make a fire from a bow drill. 
there's various means and ways of lighting fires that don't require bow drills. To illustrate this point, let's look at shelter. If conditions are not bad and you have good clothing and large amounts of food, you can of course do what the cowboys did, just sleep outside under the stars. Very attractive and quite romantic, unless it rains or there's wild animals or it gets cold. But in prepping, what we tend to do is we focus on emergency survival shelters. We chop, we hew, we build little structures like this. Now I would point out to you that this is an utter, utter waste of this man's time. Why? What he should be doing is making a mattress using the leaf debris and the wood on top and then more leaf debris and then constructing the leaf debris to make a basic hide that you can snuggle into. That will keep him much much warmer than what he's actually built. And I would argue it's probably going to keep him much much drier. However, you can see in this picture on the right that you can cover these structures and if it's the right time of year make them fairly waterproof. Now again the amount of insulation that's being shown here is laughable. If it goes below freezing you're probably going to die. Again if you have some emergency survival situation where's your bivy bag? Or why don't you make a leaf debris? Or use soil and a trowel or a shovel to build a little open cave and then cover that. Lots of ways around it. The effort involved in making this type of structure is enormous. Calories, which we won't have. Of course, this is the typical prepper picture. Man dressed in army gear, because he wants to be a soldier, I guess, is constructing a tarp. Putting the tarp up, again, Look at the leaf debris on the ground here. This again, the tarp's a good idea to go on top of the leaf debris, but it's probably a waste of time doing what he's doing. It is camping. It's not sufficient in the long haul. It's useless in a gale. It's terrible in the cold. And yet, how many preppers out there have this design in their heads during a bug out, or if they have to retreat, yes, the retreat words arrived at last, into the wilderness? A substantial number of you. And I would argue, do what I do. Save up your pennies and get a really, really good tent. Lightweight, portable, will last for years. If you're careful with it, you can repair it fairly easily using a strong cord. I use suture material, but use strong nylon to repair these. And you can carry it with you. And in inclement weather, you'll stay dry. And the mosquitoes won't get you. But, 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 who pulls? The tent eventually will catch fire, be stolen, etc, 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 and then I'll be out on a limb, and what am I going to do? Well, you construct a shelter, a temporary shelter, and a tent is a temporary shelter, and then you build one of these. This is a really, really rough build. It would take two or three days using a saw. If you've got nails and a little bit more equipment, boy, you're laughing. You need to build a home with walls and a ceiling and critically an insulated solid floor preferably with drainage and as you can see in this picture this dude has got a fire going shelter heat but what about water clean water is one of the main factors in promoting human health and longevity of lifespan Without clean water, civilization cannot exist, no matter what other things we have. Without clean water, death will come a-calling all the time. And yet, a lot of people are pushing ideas that are frankly dangerous. This kind of an idea is a nice idea to have this, if you are out of technology and better ways of cleaning water. The reason I'm saying that, this person is claiming that when you run water through this from whatever source, what you will get out is clean, safe drinking water. Absolute nonsense. I'm fairly sure that viruses, petroleum, a whole bunch of other things will not be caught from this. Again, it also means a huge amount of productivity, labor and calories burned to get all of these little pieces together to make this type of a filter. The time and effort would be best spent on other things. Don't get me wrong here, knowing basic science and being able to use forms of technology to purify water is utterly essential. 
But carrying a transparent plastic container and a micro towel is actually going to get you water that is free of bacteria, protozoa and viruses without much effort. Carrying a bunch of clear plastic bags that you fill up with water that's clear or pre-filter pre the water for most ever using a micro towel and then leaving in the sun for a day or two is going to be vastly more effective at securing you an easily available low calorie source of actual water that is really clean. Of course if you just dropped in the wilderness on your own you're out of luck but I would argue that scenario is fantasy for almost everybody. It can happen, it does happen, but it's a fantasy prep. It's very, very high impact, very, very low probability. But having your main supply disrupted or having a war break out and losing your home and your primary shelter and all municipal water and all bottled water sources is equally a high impact event, but has low to moderate, possibly high probability. That's what we should be prepping for not falling out of a plane, not being injured and being in the forest on our own. Of course, as a prepper, you should have things like a Berkey water filter or similar. I haven't found anything similar that I would trust, but the Berkey filters, the black ones, last for 10 years. It's fairly simple to use and it's low calorie. Again, you may have to pre-filter using a micro towel, but you get standard water. If you have to bug out, if you have to travel, there's no reason why you can't use something like the Lifestore 12 or any available ceramic filter. They will last a long time. Years ago I ran a 50 mile race on uh, the Appalachian Trail in Virginia. What well, part of Virginia? I don't know. East or West? I don't know. And I used a bottle similar to what the Berkey has now and it was very low technology at the time. Um, people didn't have it and I actually got a couple of the bottles, however they make now, and as I ran along I just dipped the bottle into the streams and the ponds on the Appalachian Trail and drank fresh clean water without any problems at all. Simple technology will bridge you to the point where you can collect clean water but even rainwater, if you can use SODIS methods on it using the sunlight's UVs to actually sterilize it of viruses it's going to be vastly better for you than trying to make a leaf and gravel and sand debris filter and way, way, way safer. What about fire? People in prepping and bushcrafting are obsessed with setting fire to things. And yeah, I agree, trying to find the lightning strike and capturing the fire and keeping it going is probably a bit annoying. But consider how easy it is to use a BIC. Consider how easy it is to use a ferro rod. How easy it is to store 10,000 matches in our society today. You probably don't need to get into all of these primitive methods using bow drills and the rest of it. Because there's only three points to having a fire. One, to get you warm. Two, to cook things. And three, so you can see what's going on and hopefully warn predators away from you. Biolite, hobo stoves, camping stoves, all of this stuff are technological that we won't be able to build on our own. Except for maybe the hobo stove. Now I would argue you'd find a lot of tins lying around. But I would also argue you'd find a lot of cutlery lying around. So if you're making spoons and forks and bowls using natural bushcrafting materials, you're doing it as a hobby. It has zero place in prepping. I've argued this before and people got really mad at me. But it's true. In any home anywhere in North America, you will find a gazillion metal spoons, knives, forks. You'll find loads of bowls, loads of cups. You'll find a ton of material that you can use to cook with and eat with and grid down. So there's really no point to spending a lot of time and energy making carving spoons and forks. The only point to it is if you are truly alone, which I would also argue is a prepping failure, you should have a community, it may be a way of stopping yourself going completely nuts. Now I'm not arguing here for no skills and just using technology. What I am arguing for is that you have sufficient technology that works for you. That why would you have a bow drill and a smoking furnace inside the home that's going to give you lung disease when you can have solar, when you can have wind? At this point, back to Louis.
totally beyond me. I'm not arguing that everybody does what Louis done in Puerto Rico. What I'm arguing is that you don't go from saying I can't do that, I can't invest my time and labour in that, but I'm prepping for the end of the world to relying on bushcrafting skills. It's just stupid. You need to have a functional technology that will produce you energy, light, heat, boil water efficiently, get clean water easily. You need to actually have technology in place before SHTF that you can easily use in various SHTFs. I'm not arguing that you should be able to play online gaming in SHTF, though to be honest, if you've got enough power set up and you've done it right, you probably can. In SHTF I'm planning to flush toilets and have baths. going to take some time, going to take some effort. It took some lifestyle choices. But if you're prepping for a long-term event and your main preps are a few cans and a few white rice buckets and a tarp and a bow drill, what are you doing? As I've argued before, agriculture is the only way to feed yourself and your family in a reliable way in Great Down. It's actually the only way to feed your family now, I would argue. But that's because I'm a vegan. Anyhow, I hope you enjoyed this. Um, I'm going to put up some slides at the end that show calories and stuff like that. And if you have bits and pieces, please get over to Mosaic Master One and support Louis. He's got a fabulous channel. It's high end in terms of what you're going to do for energy. But don't forget, our entire society, our entire standard of living is dependent upon energy production. If you really want to reset, and you want to go back to the 1700s, you're going to die. Faster and more horribly than those of us that are preparing for society to fall, but to bridge the gap. Not to protect ourselves and have nothing happen to us in Grid Down, but to be able to use smart and easily producible and reliable technology to transition ourselves into a new way of life. Anyway, remember in SHTF, tomorrow will always be worse than today, unless you prep. So for goodness sake, start prepping for reality, not for a fantasy. Doodles!